I'm Alan Wardis, and this is Think Radio Presents Think People. My guest today is Colorado poet Rosemary Watola Tromer. Well, and that's the thing about a frame, right? I mean, it's a limitation yeah. in, in, in and of itself. Each frame is a new doorway, right? It leads us into a new sense of possibility, but it's only as big as the doorway is. So that's why it's so exciting to know that we can choose another doorway, right? But you, in order to do that, you have to hear it. You have to hear yourself using these metaphors. Welcome to another great conversation on Think Radio. If you like Think People, then I know you'll enjoy the other shows in the Think Radio Presents family of podcasts. Think Business, a weekly discussion with entrepreneurs, innovators, and disruptors on sustainable business into the 21st century. Think Planet, conversations with thought leaders on important environmental issues. Subscribe to Think Radio Presents on iTunes, YouTube, or wherever else you get great content. And don't forget to help us spread the word by liking our social media channels and sharing the content we post. We're grateful to have you in the conversation on Think Radio Presents. Joining me today is Rosemary Watola Tromer. She's former poet laureate of Colorado's Western Slope, has authored or edited 13 books, the latest of which is called Naked for Tea, a provocative title if ever there was one. Another of her books, Holding Three Things at Once, was a finalist for the Colorado Book Award. Rosemary is a tireless teacher and speaker, inspiring others to find their own voice in workshops all across the Mountain West. She's also a mesmerizing performer of poetry and song, and I'm delighted to welcome you today. Thanks for joining me. Thanks, Alan. I'm really excited to be on Think Radio. (laughs) Well, welcome. You know, I I have to say that when somebody says the words, I'm a poet, Hmm. it's really different than when somebody uh, says, I'm a biologist Mm -hmm. or uh, anything else that has a credential attached to it. When you say, I'm a poet, you can't provide... uh, necessarily a piece of paper. Maybe you have a degree, but eh, that's not the same thing, and not all Mm. poets do. I would love to start our conversation today with with that idea. What does it mean to call yourself and to be a poet? What what does it cost to get to that point? (laughs) Well, maybe I should start by saying that I almost never would say that. Which is maybe funny. It is funny, and I'm right? going to challenge because you. It, well, it's funny because obviously I've written all these books of poems. I write a poem every day for the last 12 it's years. It's got to be that long, yeah. 12 years I've written a poem a day. So obviously I'm writing poems, but if anyone ever said to me, what do you do? I would never say I'm a poet. I don't think ever. Which is sort of the source of my question. Why is this concept of being a poet and, and having confidence in inhabiting that space, why is that mm. so hard to do? I don't know if that's the issue. Um, so part of this, I feel like, is a, is there an egoic thing about it, perhaps, you know, that, that turns me off just a little bit, where I feel like maybe... It would be, it would sound too weird for me to say I'm in service to poems. That's odd, but that's maybe much more true to my experience of what this relationship is with poems. And there is something very proud about I'm a poet. Mm-hmm. Uh, I guess I don't have the same problem by saying I'm a mother. Right. Right. Uh, but I was thinking about this a lot just yesterday. There was a panel and they were talking about kind of claiming who we are. And I think, well, <laughs> so much of what poetry is about for me is about taking layers off, taking off these layers of who we think we are, what we think we know about ourselves. Here's a here's a story about this. So about five or six years ago, over in Salida, Judith Hill was doing a workshop. And she had us all go around. It was a big circle, like 30 of us. And she had us all ask her a question to start the workshop. And I thought... I, I don't have any questions. 
Mm. You know, people were asking about publishing or you know, how do I know I'm a poet or things <laughs> like this. Finally, when as the, as it got closer to coming to me, I started to get pretty anxious as I realized what my question was going to be. And by the time it was my turn, I was in a state of full existential crisis. This and must have been one heck of a question brewing. So here it was. <laughs> you know, I said, Judith, you know, I've been reading the Sufis. And they say that we're supposed to shed all our layers of identity. And does that mean that I should stop writing poems? Because I have a lot of identity wrapped up in being a poet, traveling and writing books and performing. And but as I said this, you know, should I stop writing <laughs> poems? I was, you know, falling apart. And and Judith, I think, didn't understand my question exactly on a on a verbal level, but understood what was happening to me completely on a on a soul level. And she comes over. And you know Judith, right? She's got that crazy big hair and this, she's wearing this big blouse with 7,000 bracelets on one arm and 7,000 bracelets on her other arm and, and big skirt. And she just comes over to me and she grabs me. She pulls me into her. She kind of cradles me. And she says, Rosemary, you weren't meant for the nunnery. <laughs> And I knew just what she meant. And in that moment, I understood this. It was like I heard, this is this is so woo-woo, but here we go. It, it was me. like I heard God, divine, whatever, sure. say, um, Rosemary, you know, go out and write. Go out and have all these experiences. Go totally enjoy and figure out and meet the world and then write it all down and tell me about it. Right? It was that yeah. sweet permission, like this is your your way of engaging. This is there's and not to do it and not to do it for the self, right? So there's a this is maybe where I, I get caught up in this I am a poet as if it's a title or something. It's way more about being a way of life. Well, it's that's, way more about how we meet the world, right? That's the source of my question. I'm not talking about something that you would write on a resume. I'm talking about this space, this sacred space that you're talking oh, about. It's, that is exactly what it is. But in order to do that, in order to say, okay, awesome, I wasn't meant for the nunnery, you have to be able to say, this is what I am. And there's something sort of ineffable, ineffable about that that poets inhabit. Yeah, do we what have to say is this it? is what I am or do we just live what we are? Oh, I don't know. I think there's real power in, 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 naming, in, things. in naming things. Of course in there making is. a stand. I, I, this is Confucius. All power comes from calling a thing by its right name. Right? And I, I, I play with this all the time. Uh, you know, I have a poem called uh, She Unnames Them about how Adam went into the, into the garden and he named all the animals and then Eve went around behind him and took all their names away. And this is an interesting thing because the more we name, the more we do understand about the world. But the more we name, the more we limit what we know. The more we name, the more mm -hmm. we think, oh, well, I know what that is. That's apple. And we don't really actually look at that apple anymore because we know it's apple. Or, or I think about this, you know, I go hiking in the summer and I love knowing all the wildflowers. And as I'm walking by them on the trail, you know, I'll be like, hi, Columbine, you know, mm -hmm. hello, mm -hmm. you know, Asphodel. Then there's a flower I don't know. I give mm -hmm. it all of my attention. I'm counting its petals. I'm picking, right. I'm smelling it. I'm trying to figure this thing out. I don't give all that attention to any of these other flowers. You know, it's speaking to you in a way in that moment that the others have stopped doing because you think you know what because they are. Because we think we know something yeah. about them because we've named them, right? So there's this, I think, real power in unnaming things, mm -hmm. in in um, allowing ourselves not to know them so that we can be curious about them again and again and again and again. Mm -hmm. well, so I fight, you know, I go back and forth. You know, I do get this joy of naming i love it myself it teaches it helps us understand the world we're in and yet i would say that is the function of the poet mm -hmm. uh, 
on behalf of society, on behalf of our culture and our communities. We go around and we name things differently, right? Mm -hmm. It's not the, the textbook names for things. When, you, when a poet describes the Columbine, it's an invitation right. to see it differently. Right. Do you agree with that? Over and over and over again. I absolutely do. It's true. And, and so this, is, this actually brings me into this idea about metaphor and how metaphors serve as frames for us to understand the world. And uh, which is a really exciting idea. Yeah, well, let's let's go there because uh, you recently did a TEDx talk um, where you went deep into that idea. I would love for you to just give us the elevator pitch <coughs> version hmm. of your idea about metaphor. What's the big idea mm -hmm. behind, behind that talk? So the most important thing for us to know is that whether we're aware of it or not, everything we think is framed in metaphors. All of our language, all of our thoughts, our frames, our, our metaphorical frames that are physically present in the circuitry of our brains. And they control how we see the world. And so what's a, what's a good example so that if people we, can grab hold of? Uh, so for instance, um, here's, a, here's one of the stories about a major shift to, for this in me where I, I didn't know that I was thinking of motherhood as a test until my girlfriend heard me say so. I called her up and my son had been screaming for the whole first year of his life. It was awful. He had, you know, we took him to all these doctors. Nobody could say what was wrong with him. Mm. And of course, it's, it's terrible to feel so helpless. Mm -hmm. And also, it's just terrible to be with a screaming a anything. Not fun, no matter who you are. Oh my goodness, so hard. And I called up my girlfriend, Susan, and I said, Susan, I think I'm being tested. And she said, oh, Rosemary, it's not a test. It's a path. <laughs> now, here it is. I had created this frame, motherhood is a test. Mm -hmm. No, well, maybe it, that's true. That's true. And this other frame, motherhood is a path, also true. And when I thought about it this way, I thought, well, when I'm hiking, don't I always choose the longest, steepest, most challenging path? Hmm. And isn't that what I've been given in a child? Was the longest, steepest, most challenging path. And it didn't change things, to, right? Finn still kept screaming. Right. But, but it shifted everything I thought about how, what it meant to be a mother. Because if it was a test, I was failing and I completely hated it. And if it was a path, this was something that I could rise to. Mm -hmm. So it, it, it shifted things. But this is where I think things get really exciting, Alan, is that once we choose this new metaphor, motherhood is a path, this is like when thinking I know the flowers, right? If I get too used to this idea, motherhood is a path, it just becomes its own prison again. So it's important for us to continually challenge whatever metaphors are showing up and know that all of them are just frames, None of them are the truth. None of them are exactly mm. this. You know what, mm -hmm. what Gerard Man Lee Hopkins would call uh, the inscape of a thing, the thisness <laughs> of a thing. Right. Right? Yes. So the yeah. metaphor never touches the thisness of a thing, but it is how we understand that thing. It does help define our relationship to it. You know, one of the most interesting things you just said, though, is uh, embodied in the word choice. Mm. Mm -hmm. And that we choose which metaphor it is that we are empowering at any given moment. Right. So this is what's so important. I'm so glad you said this because most of these metaphors, we have no idea they're there. We are completely... They're like an operating system of a computer. You don't even know it's there. You have it's no just idea running. it's there. It's just running. And so they have all this power over us that we don't know they have. Mm -hmm. So there's this, this study, uh, Paul Thibodeau of Stanford did a study about how people responded to different metaphors and how it would affect their choices. So in this study, he gave a sample group this, this sentence. Crime is a virus ravaging the city. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then he gave another group this sentence. Crime is a beast ravaging the city. So then he asks these two groups, to talk about, to, to do some little test and say, what should be done about crime? The people who are told crime is a virus suggest social reform. 
-hmm. The people who are told crime is a beast suggest disciplinary punitive measures. So it completely, here, very simple, just one word. Nobody has any idea they're being manipulated, but they are. Mm -hmm. And it changes their way they think they should move forward in the world. What should we do? Well, and would you say that it even shapes what they then think is possible? Absolutely. I mean, it's not even about which pathway you're going to choose, but which one you even think is possible. What's even possible. And that's the thing about a frame, right? I mean, it's a limitation Yeah. in in and of itself. Each frame is a new doorway, right? It leads us into a new sense of possibility, but it's only as big as the doorway is. Mm -hmm. So that's why it's so exciting to know that we can choose another doorway. Right. But you, in order to do that, you have to hear it. You have to hear yourself using these metaphors, which we do. Like I said, every speaker in every language in the world uses metaphors every day, like six times per minute. And we use them effortlessly, totally fluently, without a clue we're doing it. Because sometimes people think, oh, you, you only you're, it's only true because you're a poet. No, no it's no. true for every single person on our planet. Sure. And we're seeing these things visually, and that's what oh, yeah. embeds them so deeply. This is, is true. It's really a lot of them aren't even verbal. Yeah, this is true. That uh, we, we think in these pictures, and and that shapes mm-hmm. what, and well, it shapes everything. It shapes everything that's possible. And so, what are you suggesting that we do with this knowledge? Right. So it's exciting because we all can listen, right? <laughs> like that, that's something we can do for ourselves and for each other, right? So my friend Susan, she's not a poet, but when she heard me say motherhood is a test, she kind of threw it back at me, mm. right? So we can do that for ourselves and we can do that for each other. We just have to become really good listeners, mm-hmm. right? So for instance, um, if I say, um, I'm feeling up. I'm high on life. In almost every, most metaphors are not universal, but this one is in almost all languages, happiness is associated with up, Mm -hmm. right? So it's just an interesting thing to notice. Um, Or if we say something like, uh, okay, here we go. So think about this. I'm going to beat this cold. (laughs) I'm fighting the flu. Mm -hmm. Um, she's battling well, cancer. I've got one. Um, life is a rat race. Life is a rat race. Okay, so here, this is perfect. So we take something like life is a rat race, and we see how there's immediately built into that some sense of competition. Yeah. We see that there's something in it that dehumanizes us. Well, not only dehumanizes, <clears> but <throat> wow, there's nothing quite as nasty in our uh storytelling and our experience as a rat right. I mean, you see a rat that that's a, a call to eradicate right right and so to describe ourselves as, as rats, rats running a race yeah what does that right do so what else do we do you know then we think okay if that isn't the metaphor that i want to the, if this isn't a healthy metaphor for me to engage in the world what is And then we just look around. This is the thrilling thing about metaphors, right, is that the brain can't help it. It will create sense. So we could just look around and we say, well, actually, no, life life is a glass of water. And then we just think about it for a second. Mm -hmm. Why is life a glass of water? You know, and, and there's no wrong answer here. You can there are, choose whatever metaphor the thing, you want. Here's the thing. You're so right. There are only right answers. And each metaphor we choose opens up a new frame, right? It opens up a new sense of possibility. So that we say, oh, well, no, actually, life a glass of water, that doesn't actually work. Life is, is more like a, a, a bolt of fabric. You know, life is actually more like something that's been woven together. Life is, you know, well, and then we say, well, actually, no, life life is really more like this this spotlight. That's really what it's more like. It's like something that's <laughs> shining light on, on whatever it is that we need to see. So we it, all of these are, are true. We can, Our brain will allow us to make sense out of all of them. But we slip into one then that feels like it's really helping us meet that moment, knowing that we are free. In fact, we're, we're, it's essential for us to slip out of that metaphor also and try out a new one again and again. 
And so a lot of people who really have no experience with writing poetry themselves or thinking in terms of metaphor at all might find it very useful then to go to the poets because poetry yeah. is full of this stuff. This is what we do. <laughs> Where <laughs> This a, is our currency. A poet goes into nature or into society. It's not all about reporting what you see in nature. Um, and describes relationships, describes um, the essence of things in a way that can be very useful to find your own way of looking at motherhood or fatherhood or the need to make money. I, I love your crime example. Crime, virus, a crime is a beast. How about crime is a symptom? Right. And wouldn't that then turn us toward more compassion? Right. Uh, so I, I love this trail that you're on. What do you think it would take to really shift us out of this sort of automatic response mm -hmm. to the metaphors that we've grown up with? What, what is it going to take to get the average person uh -huh. to start thinking like this and challenging those metaphors. Right. I mean, how do you get or how do we ever get ourselves to a willingness? I think usually Ellen not because uh very few of us are going to do it because it just shows up. It usually happens because there's a big problem and then we end up having to meet that problem. Mm -hmm. And we move through that, right? So yeah, I think once you get to a crisis point like I did, motherhood is a test. And you're really miserable. Misery is a really profound motivator, <laughs> right? Yes. So I, I feel like that's part of it. Uh, and what do we do when we're miserable? I mean, one of the things I we look for ways out. And one of the ways mm -hmm. people look for a way out is through poetry. Mm -hmm. Very few people, maybe not enough. You know, as, as William Carlos Williams famously said, it's difficult to get the news from poems, but men die miserably every day for lack of what is found there. And, mm -hmm. and what is found there? And what is, is found there? Understanding. Connection. Yeah. Right? Is connection. And is this sense of when you were saying earlier about, you know, this is the job of the poet. The job of the poet, I really believe, is to build this bridge between the outer world and the inner world. What's happening all around me? What's happening inside me? And the poem creates a bridge between these two things. Mm -hmm. It helps us know who we are in the world. Any poem, any poem worth remembering will do this, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And if your poem doesn't do that, you, you, will you still have some work to do then, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> it, it may still be a poem, but uh, go back and <laughs> They're all, they sit have with it so for much a bit. to teach us, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, I want to shift now and talk about naked for tea. Mhm. Mm because the word that you've used to describe the theme of this book and it's and it's obvious in what you've written and I would say it's obvious in what you've written for a long time not just this collection. This special word vulnerability. Mm -hmm. Why? Why is that something that has arisen in your pursuit of your art? Mm -hmm. as something worth uh, thinking about. I feel, Alan, like my relationship with poetry changed pretty radically about 12 years ago when I started writing poems daily. And when I started that process, it became immediately apparent that I couldn't write a great poem every day. And I think before that, when I had sat down to write, this is a very intimidating thing to do. You can really freak yourself out with a blank page this way. But when I'd sit down to write, I really only wanted to write if it were going to be good. Mm -hmm. Maybe even great. Or even <laughs> great. Maybe <laughs> even a masterpiece. Right. right? Every, every time. <laughs> and uh, when you're writing a poem every day, you pretty quickly give up the idea that you will write a masterpiece every day. Mm -hmm. Which has an enormously freeing effect. Because when we realize that's not going to happen, then our new goal, my new goal became, I will write something true every day. Very different goal. Perhaps even a harder one in some ways. Well, in some ways, right? yes. And by true, by the way, I don't mean factual per se, no, but I do no. mean authentic. I, I can't honest. be writing it to sound good, 
Yeah. It can't my point can't be just to be clever. The point has to be to have some real resonance so that I I strike something and I'm like, oh, there, there, that's it, that's it, that's mm-hmm. it. And so with that being the new practice, that really shifted everything I thought about poetry in terms of what I was doing it for. And it became much more of a a practice, right? It was much more of a practice than about a product, than about a performance. It really became about this inquiry, this personal inquiry every day. Mm-hmm. Well, when as that practice grows, I think the more willing we are to be true, then we become increasingly available to this vulnerable part of ourselves, this part that isn't hiding, that is, isn't guarding, that is... Uh, essential what is most essential about ourselves and and then we start to realize that the more that we the more we put up walls around ourselves to protect ourselves the less we are ourselves i mean if we're less ourselves what are we doing here <laughs> what are we doing here if we're not showing up as ourselves what mm-hmm. what are we doing so this is why i feel like vulnerability becomes maybe one of the very most important things for us to do. And it's based on authenticity and it's based on curiosity and it's based on um, willingness to open and open and open. And yet from an early age, vulnerability becomes the last thing any of us want to experience in the world. I mean, I think of Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, the walls that you're talking about, the barriers and the armor that we put on, those things, we start we start putting that on in kindergarten. Right. The Basque people in Spain, this is a story that may be true, but not factual. I'm not sure because (laughs) I haven't been able to verify it and I've tried. But but the story I've heard is that the Basque people uh, teach their children when they're three a song uh, to and a ritual to help them break down the walls that we build around our hearts. And they tell their kids, you know, it makes sense for you to build up walls around your heart to protect yourself because it's awful when we get hurt. Mm-hmm. Uh, no one wants to get hurt. And, and truly, it is important sometimes to protect ourselves. You, you really truly can't always be vulnerable because sometimes that there are people out there who really do want to hurt you. That's right. And there's an opposite idea that says there's something wrong with self-defense. Yeah, you, you no, no, no. I don't, that, that is certainly not what I'm saying. Right. right it, it's important to know when it's possible to be vulnerable, right? Mm-hmm. And we'll have to be able to do it at some point with someone, maybe just ourselves. Mm-hmm. Although with another person, I think that the lessons go in even deeper. But so the Basque people tell their children, yeah, if you build up this wall to protect yourself, that's important. But it's also important to periodically tear down those walls because if you don't, then no one can reach in to love you and you can't reach out to love someone else. Mm-hmm. Or even know you. Or even know you, right. So this this beautiful ritual, right, where they sing back and forth this little word, Oshua, Oshua, and they whisper it. I love this whole idea because it it helps us remember that this is a continuous process, right, of noticing the walls that we've built up out of a, out of necessity and being willing to, as much as we're able to in that moment, bring those walls down. And I also feel like vulnerability is, is a, it's like a muscle we flex in a way too, right? The more The more we taste what it's like to be vulnerable, the more we really want it. And the more we're really able to do it in in more and more situations. So the fact that I write this poem every day and then I send it out, my first draft, to thousands of people every day. They see my first drafts every day. Like, that's a, that's a foolish thing to do. <laughs> but it's also, there's a real sweetness in that to me. Like, that I think uh-huh. is a vulnerable act. Sure. And, you know, poems are, are deeply personal. And here are oh, yeah. all these strangers reading them so it's kind of a funny i've been reading a lot lately about um the art of improv yeah improvisation particularly in a musical setting Uh uh-huh and it's the parallels between what you're saying and what i've i've read from these master musicians who have spent their career learning how to be vulnerable in front of an audience right it's the same really the same concept yeah this is not music that has been put down on paper and that they've gone through and and scrubbed it and and reworked it four times before anyone sees it no this is right now in this moment 
I'm going to open to intuition, open to the muses, yeah. and simply create. This is it. And, and what I find interesting, and I would love to hear your perspective on this, is that they, these authors that I've been reading talk about technique and our slavery to technique as one of the walls. Oh, yeah. That, okay, you need it. But when it comes time to um, perform authentically in an improv setting, you have to tear it back down. Right. You have to not be a slave to technique. Would you say that's true in your experience? It's true across the board, right? That's true in parenting. That's true in writing poems. That's true in performing. I, I don't know where that wouldn't be true. Because the more we know technique, the more skills we have, the more tools we have, in a way... The more it frees us up, this is a sweet little paradox, mm -hmm. isn't it? it is. The more it frees us up to let it go. The more instinctive it is, the, uh, the more we don't need to be slave to it. Mm -hmm. I mean, in some ways it's informing us, but in some ways it allows us to break it, to show up authentically again and again and again. But this is a conscious choice, right? To sh I, I feel like that's what this really is, is the art of showing up. Mm -hmm. How do we show up? <laughs> right? As with all of our past, mm -hmm. and yet dropping all our past and meeting just this moment. Mm -hmm. Right? So that past all informs us. You can't get away from that. We're utterly, always totally informed by our past. Mm -hmm. Well, and part of that past is this idea that haunts any artist. Am I doing this right? And guess what? This is what I think is so thrilling about poetry in particular, although I think it's probably true in everything but math, even in math. <laughs> there are so many ways to do it right. There are so many ways to do it right. I, I, I love this little exercise that I play. It's a two-line poetry game that I play with a lot of students where we, t we take a line from somebody else and then we write it down. And then I say, okay, there's the first line. We're writing a two-line poem. Write the next line. It's the last line of the poem. So you write that next line. I say, okay, draw a line under that. And now write again that same first line. Write another line. Mm -hmm. Now you have a new two-line poem with a different ending. Mm -hmm. And you could do it three, four, five, ten times. You could go around a circle. Everybody reads their endings. You have 60 different endings, and they're oh. all great. They're all right. There are so many ways to do it right. And we, we tease ourselves, we kid ourselves that there is a single right sometimes, I think. Mm -hmm. But vulnerability means accepting the idea that right and wrong doesn't have to even exist at this moment. I can be vulnerable to, the, to uh, whatever right presents itself right now. I'm going to think about that. I think you are correct. I mean, I guess I would agree with that statement that that in that moment, in that in that moment, when we choose to meet it the way we do, this is perhaps a bit of a more fati that idea from the from the Stoics, right? That that we choose to not just suffer through whatever it is that's happening, but to love it. And in that moment, when we choose to meet that moment exactly as we do we know that it couldn't be any other way. If it could be any other way, it would be. But it's not, it's this way. And because it's this way, it's right. Mm -hmm. I think we could say that, I would yeah. say that. Mm -hmm. That's not exactly the same thing as saying there is no wrong way. Would you agree with that? All right, let me think about that. <laughs> because you suggested a moment ago, if your poem does not open these vistas of metaphor mm -hmm. that connect, then maybe you need to go back and think about it some more. All right, so this is an exciting idea, right? Is that this whole right and wrong, I think, is what we bring yeah. to the poem. The more we bring that idea, the more chance there is of there being a right and wrong because we've created it. <laughs> yeah. But I imagine that we're in service to the poem, right? Okay. That the poem knows more than we do. So that our job is to show up and let the poem emerge as the poem emerges. Mm. When we do that work, 
and I'm not saying it's we're not blank. We're ag- we're we're agents here. We're involved here. We are meeting this. We're bringing everything to bear that's been our past on this moment. But when we put ourselves in service to the poem, now this whole issue of right and wrong is more our own construct, and the poem is allowing what's supposed to happen to happen. We're allowing the poem to show up the way it wants to. Mm-hmm. This is all oh, a little... yes. Thank you, you. All right. Thank, thank you for that. that. That clears that up. And uh, you should know that across several interviews lately on this show, these words, just show up, have appeared. Mm-hmm. A lot of people are thinking about this in, in a, a variety of settings. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so that's not surprising. Um, is no, it? it's not. Just just show up. That's oh, yeah. a, a key that um, unlocks a lot of doors. Mm-hmm. I would like um, to finish today, although I wish we had three times as much time. Would you share Naked for Tea with us? The poem? Yes. You bet. You bet. It's called That's Right. I showed up naked for tea. I know it's not the proper thing to do. I was a bit surprised myself to find I'm wearing nothing more than this pink scarf I had on more when I left the house, but the closer I got to showing up, the less I had on. At least it is soft, the scarf. At least it is warm, the tea. You don't have to pretend you don't notice. I won't either. We'll just go on. It is a bit awkward, as most things are at first, but maybe by the time we pass the cream, you will have slipped out of your own button-up shirt, your judgment, your embarrassment, your belt. And maybe it will be so wonderful, this lack of anything between us, that by the time we get to the bottom of our cups, we'll wonder why we would ever spend an afternoon together any other way. (laughs) Well, as I said to begin, Rosemary, you are a mesmerizing performer and a mesmerizing writer. And all I can think of to say after that is thank you for joining me today. (laughs) Thank you, Alan. Thank you. Thanks for watching. Join us next week for another great conversation on Think Radio Presents Think People.